and welcome to tonight's opening of the Situating Food Symposium. My name is K.B. Jones. I'm associate professor here at the Knowlton School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the start of what promises to be an enlightening series of discussions. These conversations will form a loose fit between food and design. Tonight's keynote address is part of our autumn lecture series titled Loose Fit, organized by my colleague, Christy Ballier. If you have not already done so, please pick up a program at the table outside the doors at the top of the stairs. This is your roadmap for our sequence of activities. The events are all free and open to the public, and I'm very pleased to have you all here with us. I especially want to welcome those of you who've joined us from other parts of campus, from Columbus, from elsewhere in the Midwest, and from abroad. I also want to acknowledge and thank my collaborators who shaped this event. They represent three OSU colleges, engineering, arts and sciences, and food, agriculture, and environmental sciences, along with three research centers, the John Glenn Paulist School of Public Policy, the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center, and the Food Innovation Center. And they are each individually identified on the back of your program. I also want to take just a minute to recognize the KSA staff. I didn't really fully appreciate it until I had the chance to work with them on this school-wide event. These folks can stick jello to the ceiling. They've gotten you hotel rooms, honoraria, refreshments, and hashtags. They've designed posters, postcards, programs, and websites. And they even found you a food cart for tomorrow. They do all of this with the enthusiasm of my research colleagues from across campus. And last but not least, I, I'm most grateful to these sponsors. They've allowed us to bring such renowned scholars and civic leaders together on campus and to provide food and drink while keeping the event free to all of you. If you have not already visited the accompanying exhibition in the Banvard Gallery titled Food Situations, I encourage you to do so and to indulge in some other ways of thinking critically about growth, waste, and detritus and the myriad possibilities for understanding our food system. I want to thank all of the artists involved in the show, along with my co-curator for Food Situations, Shelley Casto, the Director of Education at the Wexner Center. In order to maximize our chance tonight to hear from the speakers, I will keep my comments very brief and reserve my opening remarks for tomorrow morning. I do, however, want to introduce the reason for situating food in the Knowlton School of Architecture. I took this photo in Gubbio, Italy some 30 years ago. It stands as a reminder that many of the questions posed this weekend are not new, and they may elicit cyclical, cyclical and familiar responses, even as we seek answers to today's urban challenges. We are witnessing remarkable shifts in the American food system, and in particular, Americans are widely embracing some of the values of slow food, but perhaps ironically at lightning speed. This is made evident by rapid and notable changes in our diets, in our buying habits, consumer demands, locations and kinds of grocery stores, food hubs, revivals of temporary markets, and my favorite, the emergence of the ubiquitous food truck. Meanwhile, nutrition issues are in the media daily, with health concerns from heart disease to diabetes and obesity, and links to our healthcare delivery system, all tied back to what we eat. While trends are undeniable, their effects on our evolving, shrinking, and growing cities are yet to be known. We must be mindful that the agency of various demographics is most uneven. Economic in impacts can be most concerning. As usual, with those with means and purchasing power, they see the greatest benefits. Who hasn't heard of the reference to the expanding grocery ch store chain, Whole Foods, as Whole Paycheck? Meanwhile, some of our favorites, including CSAs and farmers markets, they've been called out along with hybrid cars, commuter bikes, and new urbanism as stuff white people like. So this weekend, we'll be examining ways in which trends in food culture are currently or will impact urban revitalization. Productive urban landscapes represent design opportunities that require knowledge and advocacy across all our design practices. The Food District at Weiland Park 
has shown us some of the challenges along with significant potential as our KSA colleagues from planning, architecture, and landscape architecture work together to propose, design, track, and critique notable impacts on our cities. How will our public spaces, our neighborhoods, suburbs, and surrounding regions be shaped by our shifting ways of growing, buying, and eating food? Will we, be, we will be hearing this weekend important research aims and claims from our colleagues in allied fields as we try to connect the dots. We have much ground to cover, and to steal from the title of Michael Sorkin's recent book, I suspect we will be all over the map. I trust it will be a worthwhile journey. So with no further ado, I'm especially pleased to present to some of you for the first time our section head of landscape architecture, Dorte Imbert. We are very fortunate that she's joined us at Knowlton this year. And with her, we welcome to our community Andrew Cruz, KSA professor of architecture, and their son, Pierre. Dorte has published widely, including her three books about modern landscape architecture, studies about the work of Jean Canille Classe, Garrett Ekbo, and the modern garden in France. When planning for this symposium, I was both thrilled and intimidated to learn that during the spring of 2012, Dorte assembled a group of scholars and designers at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C. As I understand it, they address the many forms of aesthetic and productive landscapes that coexist in man-made nature, while opening paths for farms to re-enter cities. She may only be able to offer us a taste this evening, but we can look forward to much more to come. Please join me in welcoming Dorte, who will address Plus c'est change, plus c'est la même chose. Thank you very much, KB. Um, can I just move this? I won't translate the title, but I did have to have something French in there. Um, it's a pleasure to briefly, with the emphasis on briefly, participate in the Situating Food event for the company and the currency of the topic. I'm here um, as at KB's request, in a sense, to situate Situating Food. As she mentioned a couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago, I organized a symposium at Dumbarton Oaks that was entitled Food and the City. And I'm now writing, the, very painfully, the introduction to the volume of essays from the symposium. So this brief presentation is uh, 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 drawn from my very rough introduction. Simply stated, Food and the City was born of a desire to historically contextualize the current discourse or discourses on urban agriculture. Such statement immediately calls for a disclaimer. As I was not launching a history of urban agriculture, itself a concept with the multiplicity of applications, scales of interventions, geographies, not to mention motives and ideologies. Rather, Food in the City was to identify themes in the physical, political, and poetic ties between the production of food and urban living. Cutting across centuries and locales from 16th century Paris to the Pearl River Delta of today, the scope of inquiries remained nevertheless rather tight, with an emphasis on the late 19th to the mid 20th century. This was a period that witnessed a shift in the scale of planning and expressed new connections between food and urban systems. A period of grand plans, as you can see here, and enduring visions. Social and physical forces, such as the effects of the Industrial Revolution, as well as ideological and political ambitions, colonial expansion, nation building, and architectural manifestos, all generated new cities, housing, and settlements across Europe, North America, Africa, and the Middle East. Several of these plans hinged on the reform of urban centers. For instance, there was a direct connection between the efforts of the Salvation Army in England and rationalized planning in Germany. Here you see William Booth of the Salvation Army vision of redemption, the poor urban souls lost at sea are saved by cultivating the land in the farm colony and after graduating, sent off abroad to the colony across the sea. This is probably America. Taking small holding farming and self-sufficiency as drivers to reform decaying urban centers and generate a new type of housing, German landscape architect Lebrecht Migge, with architect Ernst May in particular, 
proposed a rational system of house and garden that would feed the family and relieve national food shortages. In the 1930s, Italy, and this is not from Mosè because it's not a very nice side of Italy, uh, exported the architectural planning and agricultural ideals of the fascist new towns in the Roman Agropontine to its African colonies. The transfer of population, technological advances, particularly in drainage and irrigation, and cultivation was to confirm the Third Rome's wide-reaching empire and secure self-sufficiency with wheat, sugar, bananas, and of course, coffee. Seemingly paradoxical, the transfer, the transfer of urban ideals to the rural environment has some notable precedents. Among these are Le Corbusier's Radiant Village and Radiant Farm, the response to peasant activist Norbert Bézard called to extend the scope of the city of the future to pay attention to the rural slums and small-scale agriculture of France. Equally radical was the epic creation of land in the claiming of Amsterdam's Isselmeer polders, conceived to produce food for Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and later Europe and beyond. The polder stands as a diagram conflating urbanism, water and soil engineering, forestry, and resettlement policy, as illustrated here in the town of Nahele, planned by Aldo van Eyck and landscape architect Mien Reus. The last precedent I would like to show is one that clearly reflects the interdependence between urban form and the production and distribution of food. The market economy of Montreuil to the east of Paris was intimately tied to the growth, production, and regulations of the capital. The village was renowned from the 17th century to the early 20th century for the cultivation of peaches, in particularly the early and late varietals. This specialized economy was made possible by a horticulture and architectural system of trees espaliered against walls. By the 19th century, the extensive system of mur à pêche, or peach walls, crisscrossed the mostly south-facing natural amphitheater of Montreuil, adding up to 600 kilometers and dominating the town's morphology. Built of stone rubble, plastered with gypsum painted white, the approximately two and a half meter walls tall walls, sheltered the espalier fruit trees from wind and accumulated heat during the days to release it at night, thus improving the region's climate significantly. Situated just outside the city walls, the fruit could reach consumers within hours of being picked, an early example of extreme localism. Perhaps it is in such overlay of cultivation and urban form that we can look for clues to think of urban agriculture spatially not as a reaction to the city, but as an exchange with the city. In that light, Michel Devigne, who will be our glimpser this semester, this coming semester, and Jean Nouvel's 2009 submission for Grand Paris redefines the suburban rural interface. Devigne describes the 800 kilometer long band surrounding the city as a lisière, a term for a forest edge or a seam. He structures this seam with the elements of a long gone farming landscape, hedges, ditches, thickets, and paths, and an infrastructure of greenhouses, allotment gardens, recycling, energy production, composting, and sports field. Strictly codified, it is a terrain for exchange and experimentation, a means to make the landscape accessible to all users. This scenario hems the suburbanization of the countryside and allows agriculture to re-enter the urban. In a sense, there is a reversal in the perception of the rural supporting the urban world. Agriculture directs urban expansion, and urban populations support the revitalization of rural territory. Thank you. Indeed, a delicious taste, and the book will be fabulous. Thank you very much, Dorte. And now I'm particularly pleased to introduce our symposium opening keynote speaker. Mose Ricci is professor of urbanism at the University degli Studi di Genova. He's also taught in Italy at Chieti Pescara and at the Modern University in Lisbon, the Technical University in Munich, and has been a visiting Fulbright Fellow at Harvard. As principal of Ricci Spaini Architects in Rome, he has won international competitions and exhibited at the Venice Biennale. Ricci and Spaini's works have been exhibited here, in fact, 
His Francavilla al Mare Hotel was part of the traveling exhibit of new works of 10 Italian architects that we hosted in 2000. Professor Ricci has edited and published several books, including his most recent, entitled New Paradigms, including European examples of progressive environmental practices. Mosè recently led a star-studded gathering that included Arcazum's legend Andrea Branzi, Joannones, Kengo Kuma, Winnie Moss, and others at La Sapienza, Rome's Ecological Design Symposium, just this last September. It is with great pleasure to welcome Mosè here. Please join me. So, so good evening, and Mosè Ricci, as Kavi said, thank you very much to her and to the faculty of Ohio State University for inviting me. And um, uh, I have to apologize first for my language because I am far from here from U.S. since uh, some year, and I don't know if I am understandable, but you can interrupt me and can ask uh, <laughs> explanation to me. Um, I am not an expert of cultivating food. Um, I just could try to situate the food inside the contemporary urban narrative and to look at it with glasses of an architect. In other words, I would try to explore, explore the new paradigm of food and vegetable gardens in the city after the metropolitan era. This is a quotation of um, Carlos Carpa, uh, but uh, it's very difficult to find this sentence in the literature of Carlos Carpa. Maybe he, he, he told this in, uh, during a lecture. Uh, but in any, in any case, everybody knows that 50 years ago, almost, Carlos Carpa, that was an architect famous for his skill in construction, concepts, and details, um, said that the gardens has to do, have to do with the quality of the life and with happiness. And the important thing for me is that he did not say houses. He said gardens. So uh, this uh, speech could have been titled also Learning from Detroit. You know, uh, we, we learned from Las Vegas uh, many years ago, but probably we have to go back and, uh, and see what happens here in, in this uh, part of the states to understand something crucial for the urban future. And, uh, and we are focusing on it. Um, I had a, a grandmother that was the, the daughter of an important painter in Italy, and she was very open-minded, and she said always to me, uh, look at what happened in the States, because it will happen here after 10 years. I don't know if it is true already, but something that has to do with Detroit is already happen, uh, happening in Italy and in Europe and in all over the Western world, and I will try to, um, to explain this concept to you. I don't want to sell, uh, you know, refrigerator uh, uh, in Iceland, but uh, I mean, it's the view from outside uh, of Detroit. I started to be interested in, um, in the topic of Detroit um, almost three years ago when I was preparing with Pippo Ciorra, Sara Marini, Paola Viganò, Rainier de Graaf, and Jean-Philippe Vassal, the recycle exhibition at the Maxi Museum of Contemporary Architecture and Arts in Rome, the museum made by Zadid that you probably uh, did see. We wanted to show in Italy, how recycled practices and experiences in architecture, in urbanism and landscape architecture all over the Western, I would say, world, can generate quality and beauty for the inhabiting space such, such as the new construction can do. This short video by Pierpaolo Pasolini that was a famous Italian movie director and writer, shows the base concept of the exhibition, how narrative and project can transform a landfill, a landfill in a topography. This was made in Rome uh, 30 years ago, and uh, that was the landfill of Rome. But, uh, 
becomes uh, a mantra in, in the Pasolini project. The exhibition uh, in, in Rome, the recycle exhibition, has been very successful and uh, is still now, I think, the most visited show at the Maxi Museum uh, since uh, its opening in uh, 2000. Then, the theme of recycling architecture, landscape, and cities has become Recycle Italy, a national university research campaign funded by the Italian Ministry of Education to a team of 11 Italian universities and many other linked European schools. Uh, but this is another topic, you know. Uh, we start, I was uh, um, curating the landscape and the urbanism issues of uh, exhibition, and um, I started um, from uh, what's happening all over the world, around the world, and particularly here in the States, and I asked it to Charles Valdine, that is the chair of landscape at Harvard now, um, to suggest me some projects of recycling landscape or, or cities interesting in, in the States, and Charles told me just go to Detroit. You cannot understand this topic here in America if you don't go there and, uh, and, um, and check. So my interpretation of Detroit is concerning the actual situation. It was three years ago, I mean, uh, and, and now is, this is relevant and can have effects even in Europe. You all know what happened. I don't explain this, um, this slide. But the, 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 inter the interesting thing for me is that um, the, the, for, the, the, the for this metropolis, the, the most important metropolis of, uh, of the world in our vision of the economy, of the modern economy, was forced to think about the problem of its survival and its fate in the space of few years, I mean, they, they lost more than one million of inhabitants and more than um, 320,000 jobs between 2001 and 2008. The result is the abandonment of the center uh, for an area with an approximately eight mile ra radius. In Detroit, the figure, the figure as the union of form and use and sense, like Roland Barthes wrote, of the modern city inside the eight mile divide disappeared. Detroit is now like an American Pompeii. More than 2,000 buildings have been knocked down. The city does not express anymore a traditional urban figure. And uh, the fact is that the city is that together with the economy that generated its spaces. Yeah? Uh, nevertheless, I think that mm, in this period, more than 10 years later, something is happening in Detroit. Detroit is slightly finding another dimension. After the phase of the art conflict, the city narrative highlighted the, the fascination of ruins. Like in this bird eye view by Alistair MacLean, or in these famous images of nature recovering houses or empty infrastructures, abandoned service building, and office building and factories. The rhetoric of ruin gave a new sense to what remains of the modern city and produced many, you know, cultural material like this disassembled by Andrew Moore. It is a sort of funeral of modernity that we are, we all, the scholars, are celebrating in Detroit. And um, the Ruskin-like image of the stones of Detroit are describing a kind of American archaeology able to seduce and to attract scientific and popular interest. We all feel the horror and the charm of the dead body. Uh, as for any other archaeological site, it happens. The strength of this, uh, uh, in a very romantic, in a way, 
romantic figure of Detroit stands on the idea of having an, an history to tell about and uh, on the concept of uniqueness. Nowadays, nowadays, there, there is just one place in the world where it's possible to be present live at the death of a modern city. And this place is Detroit, able to catch the fantasy um, of people and to move tourism. It is a new urban figure that gives to the existing ruins a new value that does not consist in the industrial production of material, but in the production of sense. But in my opinion, the most important thing that is happening in Detroit is another one. So, something that has to do with life more than with death. This is the same image, infrared before and now repopulated by nature. The settlement condition that we can experience in Detroit is uh, one that traditional urban cult culture is unable, unable to deal with. When I went to Detroit uh, two years ago, the, the first time, the best city tour map was called Cloud Spots in Detroit, best places for viewing the skies, sponsored by cities authorities. No? That was very strange for me. They, they choose, uh, I think, 31 places of interest for, one, for Detroit, that is the American 11 biggest cities, uh, but are not that much. And these places of interest, there is, this guy is standing uh, still, these places of interest were clouds, man-made clouds, natural clouds, or um, dross scapes, abandoned place, and uh, top 10 teen spots, things like that. Manholes emitting small produced by the underground heat, or clouds. But the important thing is that they generate tourism, like those with their wheeled boots that go around downtown Detroit, like they do the same in the Colosseum in Rome, for example. Tourists that visit Victorian-style houses taken over by nature, huge abandoned buildings, renaturalized infrastructure close to Lafayette Park, artificial home-like trees, and then the, 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 the very well-known project, Heidelberg, abandoned areas that become sites for artistic installation, and, and so on. But tourists are there, I mean, and uh, this is a perfectly restored inn for, um, uh, for making an hotel in the center of, uh, of Detroit. And then, more than tourism, there are markets selling second-hand objects where you can just trade things, another kind of landscape installation. This is the, the than Pithira, or recycled buildings like the Michigan Theater that became a, a parking lot for the, the two stadiums that they brought, rebrought in the center of the city. Um, in, other, in other words, all those features took place of traditional urban figures and they give the ruins uh, back to the narrative and to the nature by transforming Detroit into the first post-metropolis. They are like new urban devices, either material or impalpable, which in other terms reduce, reuse, and recycle the little that remains of the city into a living, living landscape. And now I did, living in the center of Detroit is not that bad. This is in Italian, I, I apologize, but you can understand. No? All the values are changing since uh, 2000, 2012. 
in the moment in which the city fails, um, landscape emerges um, as its infrastructure. Forests, urban farming, superficial lake and water depuration plants are replacing the dismissed activity. The real estate market is growing up again in percentage. In percentage. In percentage, in 2012, Detroit was one of the best performing cities in USA for the rise of the housing market. And there are many families, young people, families, that return or go to live inside the eight mile divide. It does not look like a process of changing that aims to replace what was there before. The traditional tools of urban development are unsuited to, tra to treating the Pompeii effect which involved the city in the most striking form, as the Detroit situation shows us. It does not look like a process of urban regeneration or re-qualification in, in, uh, in a usual uh, significance of the term. The idea of future Detroit is the idea of generating new values through the reduction of traditional metropolitan functions, the reuse of vac vacant and abandoned space, and the recycle or surviving urban materials. Again, giving new sense to the existing cities. This seems to be the key point of the rebirth of a city. The new master plan of Detroit by Chris Reed, Stoss, Landscape Urbanism, is working on systematizing spontaneous processes on food production, on energy saving, and production for renew renewable sources, on ecological performances of the city, on the open air spaces of the city. on the produ production of food. With uh, those schemes and suggestions for productive uh, landscapes and uh, tactics to address spontaneous behaviors. So Detroit is slowly be becoming the first post-metropolis, I think. It's a, it is a condition that um, the disciplinary literature already anticipated in different ways with the writings of uh, Jane Jacobs, The Death and the Life, she said, uh, David Hervey, Stanford Quinter, Edward Soja, you know all of this. But in the Detroit experience, uh, Detroit is a sort of manifesto, the new urban condition depends, of course, on the disaster of the economy and on the imagine of the uh, on the ima image of the nature regaining the city, but not only. In the history of the city, every new cycle of life keeps inside the signs and the stones of the pre-existing one. But I think that the post-metropolitan condition of Detroit does not, do not have to do that much with the charm of the ruins, but has to do with the substitution of certain traditional metropolitan materials with on one side, artificial, artificial vicinity means and abstract networks for instant communication, and on the other side, with the quality of a slow life in the open space of the city. If we think of the city as a field of relationship, at, as a Sigmund Bauman wrote, the virtual words influence our ways of living, working, conducting business, and building the inhabiting space. The post-metropolis is an urban figure that works on the spatial effect of a social and economical, uh, the economic organization based on the artificial communication means and on the social and, ecolo and ecological targets of the future city development. In this sense, the post-metropolis is detached from the modernity. And this is because it does not need the same kind or the same intensity of physical facts, mobility, infrastructure, specialized inhabiting space, traditional industries that represent the cities of the modern age. 
if we can work, relate to other person, and make things through not material connections with computers, smartphones, interactive TV, and other and more sophisticated devices, we should, why should we build our living, our living space as we did until now? Why should we live in a polluted environment? Why should, shouldn't we adapt more space for the quality of our lives, live, lives for cultiva cultivating and eating food zero mile and so on? This condition is particularly evident in Detroit, but it is not unique. This is Rome, illegal vegetable gardens at the Garbatella in the open air, uh, unused spaces waiting to be built and, and unbuilt because of a crisis. And this is Rome again, and this is the map of 153 community-run green areas, 66, uh, 66 small urban gardens and players, 57 edible gardens, and 30 guerrilla gardening actions. All of this is unofficial, I mean, made by citizen. This is uh, Occupy Rome illegal vegetable garden at the Terme of Caracalla. Here, cultivating is a, a landscape strategy that redefine image and overall all urban quality through the redesign and the governance of the, of the governance of the city's open space, which once again becomes productive. This is EU Torto, a social rehabilitation experience, a community-run vegetable garden of a currently unemployed former software company workers. They decide to find a new job cultivating land. Uh, and this is Hortus Urpes. It is a garden in a recovered, abandoned area of the Appia Antica Park, where uh, solely ancient Roman plants are cultivated. The garden are uh, 16 uh, square-shaped flower beds and um, 225 square meters of uh, surface. Is added with the help of volunteer gardeners and for free. And this is uh, Ortolino, a temporary urban educational mobile vegetable garden at the monumental area of Aquario Romano, where pupils in age between 6 and 12 can learn to grow vegetables and flowers and to harvest fruits. At the same time, Ortolino is a landscape installation in an historical garden. Ortolino is uh, an open public space, permanent laboratory for social and uh, environmental sustainability. This is the space of Aquario Romano and then the necessity to move the, the edible garden because of the sun and because of different happenings in the garden, in the historical garden. And those are the, the pupils working to, to Ortolino. So, even in Italy and in Europe, cities are not so far from Detroit, as we could see. The demise of economy and the abandonment of, of the built space involves also the new construction in our situation. In Italy, this is inevita inevitable and unexpected, consequence of the most extraordinary boom in the history of the building sector. And, uh, and the landscape has felt the impact of this incredible booming. Since 1997 to 2012, I would say, this is 2009, we built almost 300 million cubic meters per year in our territory in Italy. Then, after 2007, in five years, we, we have lost 35% uh, in uh, the construction market price, and 40% of the uh, construction uh, production is not sold. We have 200, 
6,000 kilometers of uh, disused road, 6,000 kilometers of unused railways, um, 5.2 million of empty houses. And the situation is not different in Spain, in other places in Europe. This is Cesena, 45 minutes from Madrid in the province of Toledo. There is a sort of new little town, is a suburb of Madrid actually, uh, for um, uh, 30,000 inhabitants, entirely complete but empty. Cesena, but should have been a residential suburb of Madrid for young families and, and elderly people, is today a ghost city, a monument to the Spanish crisis. And a uh, few days ago, the London School of Economics Science, the blog on the internet, published this uh, research by an Italian scholar that, that said uh, how the economy uh, situation in Italy is um, dangerous for the survival of a country. So, I mean, looks like a, a piece of of Detroit. The Dutch pavilion to the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2010 was an empty room uh, with the weight of the Ramstadt empty um, suspended on, on the heads of the visitors. And then again in the 2012 the Dutch pavilion was dedicated, dedicated to reset, restart. And the German pavilion was dedicated to reuse, reduce, recycle. This was after our exhibition in Rome. For one time we arrived before the Germans. We depend from them. And, um, and, and this is the, the, the city map of Munich in the project named Agropolis made by Jörg Schroeder and his group of uh, uh, landscape designer and urbanist. Um, they, they won a competition about, that was about the future of the city. How do, how, how do you see the future of Munich in the next 20 years? That doesn't mean in the next 50, it, it means tomorrow. And uh, it was a com an international competition for young architects and they won with this um, project that was uh, forecasting the production of food uh, for all the whole region of Munich in, uh, in, um, inside the city, um, taking care of the public gardens that the admi municipality administration cannot maintain anymore and occupying the spaces for the new construction unbuilt. This is the Freiham district, that is the place where Munich should enlarge, where the city of Munich should be enlarged in the next year, but because of the crisis of the market, even in Germany, they, they don't do that. And so the proposal of Agropolis Group was to occupy and for, with a temporary vegetable garden, with a temporary production of food, this um, Freyam site. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that step by step, this uh, virus of producing food in the city can affect all the city of Munich and all the region a sort uh, of uh, um, implement at the regional scale, uh, scale by occupying ever increasing space and redesigning the metropolitan landscape. This is the group of architects with their tools. Uh, and uh, this is the, 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 the map of the um, production of food inside the city of, of Munich. And uh, moreover, cultivations and vegetable gardens can spread like wildfire to cover the terraces and the roof of private homes and the public parks that are too expensive to look after. It's a matter of social politics that concern the quality of food and the lives of, uh, of citizens that takes into consideration rural nature as well an aging population and the job crisis. For example, they say 
when uh, the, 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 the traffic uh, will be too expensive and too polluting for the city, we can um, use the streets, the roads, for producing food, even in the center of, of the town. Uh, that was uh, paradoxical, but this is the image of the opening of the first construction site of the new Munich three years ago in Freiham, and they opened already three construction sites for urban vegetable garden and production of uh, and production of food in the city. And this is what Pierre Donadier said of this uh, uh, project. Uh, Barcelona recycles through gardens as well. In a city bustling with synergy, contemporary, and not completely integrated actions. The concept behind the intervention is linked to the use of a pattern that is analogous to the one for the Gat Pack Le Corbusier plan that organizes urban traffic on a grid made up of by three blocks instead of one per one blocks. You know, the circulation, Barcelona is this uh, grid like the American cities, and, uh, and, um, and they are using all the streets, and the proposal of the administration, of the new administration of Barcelona, is to use, like in the Le Corbusier plan, a three per three grid, and um, uh, let the, the inner streets free for being cultivated or used at public spaces or like garden. This is not a, a dream. I mean, this is the, the new uh, master plan. They opened the, the, the construction site. They already realized pieces of this, of this plan at the head of a diagon diagonal here in this part of Barcelona. This is the, the um, uh, urban scheme of green infrastructuring uh, Barcelona. So, the Detroit, uh, the Detroit effect, how it was called in the, in, the, in the exhibition, is already operating in Europe, as you, as you could see. And not only the production of performing open spaces, but also the fact of giving new value to the existing that we are going to lose uh, through cultural devices of, of action is another effect of, um, of Detroit on our world. Uh, in Paris, it was possible to visit until November 1st, until, until last week, and I went, um, this uh, tower, Tour Paris 3, uh, this is uh, a building that has to be demolished uh, by January 2014. The inhabitants uh, and other art operators uh, called street artists from all over the world and they 99 or 100, 99 plus one street artists coming from all over the world, from Australia, Brazil, States and so on, uh, to this small building um, on the riverside uh, in, in Paris um, to make their installation inside the building and give much more value to what they want to demolish. And uh, just to uh, try to, to make it, uh, um, to avoid the, the, the demolition, but also to invent big performance. It was possible until today, I think, or tomorrow, uh, uh, to make a tour on internet and to save a part of the installation represented in, on the side, pixel by pixel. Uh, you can select the installation that you prefer and you can save it and keep it in internet. Other way, otherwise, it will be uh, lost as the building will be. And those are pictures from the inside. This is about situating food like the first uh, in Gubbio, we survived in a different age. And finally, what, what can we, to answer to the, to the previous question, what can we learn from Detroit? 
The first thing is that Detroit demonstrates that the modern city is that uh, with the economy that generated its spaces. At the end, and also that the end of modern city is decidedly changing the way we think about the futures and the form that it, it's taking. And this is an issue that direct, directly affects the lives of the citizen and sets qualitative targets of a different kind. The second thing that we learn from Detroit is that one post-metropolitan phase for our cities is possible and probably it is not bad. It is something in the middle between the images that Jane Jacobs and uh, Edward Sojal provided to us in the literature. And it is depending from the relative harmony that the urban life has regained in uh, the Detroit inhabiting spaces, uh, even if they are unusual and not necessarily fast. The third thing that we can learn, we learn from Detroit is that this phase of demising modernity requires new paradigms, as Thomas Kuhn said, a new point of view about the future uh, for architectural um, landscape and city projects and new project devices. The fourth is that the most significant projects for the future of the post-metropolitan city are projects with shared, shared authorship. They put together the initiatives of planners and designers and the spontaneous urban action of the city makers. In one, just one collective project, they build a clear new urban figure. This is the real challenge that Detroit is launching to the design world, to abandon the authorship, for example. Five, that the shift from a system of measurement, the territory, to a system of values, the landscape, seems to be the most radical change in the urban culture. We don't need any more to give a measure to the things, but we need to give a sense to the thing that change completely our behaviors. And, uh, Cultivating cities, oh yeah. something went wrong. And what happened? And cultivating cities has a big part in it. And I go with that, you remember the image. And, <laughs> and uh, and that this culture of the city is both the production of food and the production of ideas, of new ideas, of new culture. Like, okay, like we saw in the Detroit experience. Okay, here we are. Mm -hmm. Producing food and producing culture as devices for new economies and better quality of life in the city after the metropolitan age. We can, uh, yeah. If you want to be happy, all life long, just provide yourself with the garden, said Carlo. You can go, huh? said Carlo Scarpa, and uh, probably Detroit is showing us. Yeah, is showing us a possible direction, like this project by Andrea Branzi, an Italian radical designer. You know him, part of Archism Group. And it is this sort of utopian 
and provocative vision of Agronica, a metropolis where urban agriculture is uh, determining the, sh the shape and the beauty of the city. We can This was a project, as you probably know, made uh, almost 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and was presented even recently to the Biennale of um, Venice, but was uh, surprised me, and that's why I invited him, uh, Branzi, in this, um, in this symposium on ecological design in Rome that KB quoted before was surprised me is, you know, the, the, the precision of the idea of Branzi, and now he could forecast the future of, of the organization of the urban space of the metropolis um, with the, at the center, the production, the production of food and uh, the agrarian, the rediscovering of the agrarian nature of our land. Now this go ahead uh, a lot of time, I don't know, I think if you want to ask me something. So. Thanks for having me. Uh, all over the world, I mean, and not, not just uh, here in uh, 
the American. And uh, in this way, it is a sort of rebirth of the secret. It is something um, completely new is growing up in Detroit. And if you go there, I mean, many of you probably somebody is from Detroit. But uh, when I've been to Detroit, it's, it's very uh, nice, I would say, to live in Detroit at this moment and, and to sort of go around the city. And also the idea that it's possible to go there for a living is a good idea in my opinion. I've heard many friends from New York that they want to move or they, their son want to, or want to move to Detroit to live because uh, it costs nothing and the quality of the life seems to be the But um, yeah. I think it is sort of independent from the quality of the single project, but the group process is really interesting. It might be more interesting than the rhetoric of the, the dead body that helps. I mean, we had Brasco, we have, all of us are enthusiastically fascinated by the ruins, by the archaeology, by the. Uh, okay, that, that's. Uh, we need that to, to, to bring that other part, other economy to, to, to that place. But for me, the most important play, the fact that is happening, is the rebirth of the city in a completely different uh, character.
social organization. And so I think, I mean, in Detroit, in there is a hope, like, like the, the, the teacher said. If you ask an American about Detroit, even maybe yesterday, she said to me, she said to me, Detroit is unique. Yeah. Unique. It's unique. Yeah. I don't know if it is so unique. I mean, it, of course it's unique. You know, what happened in Detroit happened in Detroit. But the demise of, of this uh, uh, modernity and, and this economy of uh, uh, big industries and so on is uh, something that is affecting. The context of my comment about Detroit being unique is that with bankruptcy and a failed local government lot of the urban problems that make the a lifestyle that we take for granted in cities unviable, we can contrast it with something like Indianapolis, which has Unigo, which has another governmental model that allows them to do things like develop a cultural trail around the city. So with the impact of a well-organized system and the resources to go with an effective communal government, we see a very different model. So my point about Detroit community was that its failure as a city doesn't bode well in terms of giving us models for other urban organizations for plant. You're proposing a potential that the growth from within with individuals having freedom to take over lands that have lost value is a completely different model. And in my understanding of cities, that is unique in American yeah. cities. That they, if the land has lost, the value of land is really bottomed out, which changes everything in terms of the but we all will reconvene in the morning when we will hear from some of our colleagues from the north, including Dan Pomeroy from the project called Eastern Market in Detroit. And we look forward to learning a great deal from him about the inside. Here we have a few from scholars and composers. Um, and from Harmony, who's there working on the urban development in the city, should be a very exciting conversation. I welcome all of you to join us again in the morning. Breakfast will be here at 9 o'clock. At 9.30, we'll begin the uh, preparation to lead into our first panel, uh, which will start at 10 a.m. At this point, it's my great pleasure to invite you to the reception that will be taking place here in the center space of the Hall and we'll sing all tomorrow. Again, let's express our appreciation to you.